Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we will continue to read Out of the Shadows, Reimagining Gay Men's Lives by Walt Odets. We're continuing Gay Men's Relationship. Ways that gay relationships work. Not that you would know if from the idea of the homosexual or conventional, socially constructed models, what relationships between two men are in many ways like those between any two human beings. Some are wonderful, some are good, some are good enough, and some languish in unspoken tragedy. All relationships are too emotionally complex to completely decipher. And gay relationships carry the obvious, additional burden of widespread disapproval. But gay relationships potentially offer at least three benefits that distinguish them from heterosexual alliances. They may draw on a male camaraderie that is rooted in both the inborn and acculturated male sensibility. They are relationships between two men, one or both of whom may possess a more inclusive blend of male and female sensibilities, and they offer sexual possibilities and thus a breadth of emotional expression that are often unavailable to conventional heterosexual couples. Gay relationships are usually an inside-out process that helps surmount the limitations of the outside-in, socially constructed relationships that would dictate expected and appropriate feelings and behavior. In today's American society, one man simply loving another is still an inside-out form of life. Male camaraderie is often beneficial for gay male relationships, even if it has roots in the limiting and problematic pure male sensibility. One need only think of a football team to conjure up pure male camaraderie, or, more on topic, the element of male camaraderie in the relationship of Morris and Billy, whose blended sensibilities were introduced in Chapter 1. Their solution to who gets to be on the bottom was to arm wrestle, an obviously male solution to a distinctly unconventional male dilemma. But a male camaraderie and a gay camaraderie are not mutually exclusive, at least in gay relationships, the sensibility that allowed Morris to experience Billy as a beautiful, sweet, gentle woman had been accomplished through an expression of male sensibility, a contest of physical strength. Both kinds of camaraderie are bonding, and Morris and Billy were bonded in both their conventional male strengths and their important strength of feminine sensibility, without which intimate relationships are invariably problematic. Most men have a mutual understanding of one another that I'm not sure is possible between men and women. The two genders, significantly as a consequence of the developmental gender split described in Chapter 1, so often find each other indecipherable. After 30 years of conducting psychoanalysis, Freud himself is reputed to have once asked, What does a woman want? A 2016 Google search seemed to confirm the ongoing bewilderment of both genders. The entry, what do women want, provided 1.07 billion results in 0.35 seconds, the first of which was headlined, listen up fellas, here's what women really want. A search on what do men want, provided 1.03 billion results, and the search on what do gay men want, a meager 178 million. Notably, the searches on men and women both returned results that largely informed men about what women wanted from them, and vice versa. Exploration of who men and women are was largely absent in the responses. The results for gay men were much more about the discovery of what it means to be gay, rather than what a gay man might want from another. On the whole, gay men have thought a great deal about who they are and already know who other men are what they want. Because gay men in relationships usually share not only biological sex, but some variable measure of both inborn and acculturated male sensibility, gay relationships can suffer some of the limitations that a pure male sensibility introduces into any intimate relationship. The emotional opacity of pure male sensibility interferes with the expression of intimacy and mutual support, the conscious clarification of problems and the mediation of solutions. Women and men with 
with some internalization of women's sensibilities, are thus usually necessary for any enduring, intimate relationship. In the polarizing acculturation of the traditional gender split, men are taught to do things only and directly for others, for example, by providing economic support. They are expected to go out into the world and are taught to respond to emotional conflict with withdrawal, denial, anger, or aggression. An intimate relationship between two men does not even exist when both are relating through withdrawal, denial, anger, or aggression. When such relationships endure, they are largely built on the bond of conflict, which is, unfortunately, the only way some people, especially men, know how to experience connection. Think again of football. As adults, we continue to grapple with the feelings of helplessness and dependency that are first necessarily experienced in infancy and childhood. Struggles over the balance of power are thus significant in most adult relationships. In gay male relationships, the struggle also exists, but its resolutions are often somewhat different from those of heterosexuals. How two men structure power in their relationship cannot, and need not, rely on traditional gender roles, which have done little good for anyone. Just as gay men must invent themselves, they must invent their relationships. One of the important inventions is to borrow and slightly reconstruct a concept from the family therapist Jay Haley to find some balance integration of complementarity and symmetry. It is this balance that provides stability and bonding within any relatively happy, intimate relationship. In complementarity, partners balance power by complementing each other's differences. In symmetry, they find balance in equity. This two-type balance can be particularly difficult for young men, who, in their 20s, are often still struggling for an adequate sense of autonomy and identity in my therapy work with gay couples, I am inclined to think of successful relationships as a balance between two conflicting requirements, mutual support for each man's individual needs and personal growth, and the fundamental relationship required of being emotionally bonded and together. The former relies significantly on complementarity, the latter on symmetry, and a relatively happy relationship allows some measure of both. For young men, the need for personal growth often overpowers the capacity for togetherness, which becomes more available with greater maturity and a more assured sense of self. For men of all ages, the balance between two men requires invention, and invention is most needed and available in unconventional, emotionally constructed relationships. A useful balance within gay relationships is often expressed partly through sexual practices, to meet the emotional needs of both men, Morris and Billy explicitly pursued symmetry in their versatile sexual life. In some other gay relationships, sex more clearly expresses complementarity, in which each man is largely the top or the bottom. A partner who holds the balance of power outside sex may be more sexually passive and receptive. Non-sexual matters also offer a range of solutions to the balance of complementarity and symmetry. If an older partner holds the authority of age, experience, or money, the younger partner may balance that with special skills, greater experience with gay life, physical appeal, or the simple fact of greater height or physical strength. Sex. Money and sex are both often experienced as measures of power and control, and are the two common relationship hotspots for both gay and straight couples. Gay men's forced adolescent segregation of sex from relationships, the stigma attached to homosexual sex, the conventional acculturation of males, and the inborn nature of male sexuality are four influences that conspire to create sexual issues for gay couples. The most common issue is probably the waning or loss of sexuality within the relationship, which contrary to popular perception, is most often initiated in longer-term heterosexual relationships by the male. Males, straight and gay, withdraw from sex for many reasons, 
but one of the most common is fear of humiliation for not being able to perform. For gay couples, the male sensibility that motivates withdrawal is likely to be more or less doubled. As a result, the incidence of diminished sexuality is probably higher among gay couples than straight ones. Diminishing sex with gay relationships can follow from other issues also seen in heterosexual relationships, including broadly based power struggles, anger, and emotional withholding. But in gay relationships, diminishing or absent sex also often has distinct developmental roots. Gay adolescents and young men are often limited to sexual lives that allow only highly eroticized libidinal sports sex that is focused on novelty, orgasm, and demonstrations of prose and performance. Such sex largely excludes, often even forbids, the expression of emotional intimacy, which is precisely what is needed to sustain sex in longer-term relationships. Ongoing relationships require at least some transition from pure sports sex to relationship sex that remains erotically engaging but also communicates intimacy, affection, and attachment. Sex can be one of many ways that two men share their lives. The transition from pure sports sex to something more emotionally inclusive is often difficult for those with a more purely male sensibility. A beautiful, potent body engaged in hot sex with the beautiful body of an idealized stranger is what all men, but particularly gay men, have been acculturated to believe is the definition of good sex. Long-term partners usually know way too much about each other and each other's imperfect bodies for either to buy the I'm hot, you're hot, let's fuck approach that characterizes most gay adolescent in much adult singles sex. When the male sensibility cannot make any transition from pure sports sex to relationship sex, both gay and straight couples experience a loss of sexual interest. Against this loss, straight couples often have an advantage. They have some measure of feminine sensibility in the game, and sensibility much more attuned to emotional expression. Among gay men I have worked with in therapy, those with no previous sexual experience with women almost invariably have more difficulty understanding the idea of relationship sex. In contrast to the feminine sensibility, the male sensibility appears to have an inclination, probably partly inborn, for sex split off from emotional connection. In split off sex, an enduring erection and an orgasm with profuse ejaculate appear to be the measure of success. These measures, based on the ridiculous presumption that involuntary erection and ejaculation are a personal accomplishment, make sex a test of physical performance. Even as connection and self-discovery are often the unconscious motivations, the performance model drives most adolescent sex, and it is a conspicuous theme of most pornography. For both gay and straight boys, Internet pornography now offers an easily available correspondence degree with a major in sex from a third-rate faculty with a poorly conceived curriculum. When gay men meet after graduation, they quite naturally share what they learned in school. Despite similar education, straight adolescents do have a developmental advantage over gay boys. Straight boys are clearly in training for relationships with girls, not simply sex. With girls who are relationship material, straight boys are expected to act as if sex, feelings, and relationships were somehow related. Thus, the transition from sports sex to relationship sex is something many straight boys have at least anticipated during adolescence, perhaps only as an obligation to the unintelligible nature of women. In contrast, the gay adolescent is usually taught that gay sex is bad and dirty, he is rarely in training for any relationships he wants. The inclusion of sex in relationships or relationships in sex feels like forbidden cross-contamination. This training in keeping sex and feelings separated from each other supports a conventional male sensibility that can be difficult to unlearn. The training easily extends into adult life 
and even men with a highly developed gay sensibility, which includes some feminine sensibility, still often carry unconscious feelings that they must protect primary relationships from the contamination of sex. They protect their partners from the degradation that sex would inflict, and they protect themselves from being seen as sexually emotional beings by the men with whom they live their daily lives. With purely erotic sports sex unsustainable and unacceptable within a familiar, long-term relationship, men sometimes find themselves sexually aroused only by objectified, idealized strangers who would not hold sex against them and would not, themselves, be degraded by sex. For sex detached from feelings is what the idealized sexual object is for. Human beings are among the two or three most sexually active of the mammalian species and are certainly the biggest blabbermouths. Nevertheless, we have extraordinary difficulty talking about sex. In the United States, we live in perhaps the most erotophobic, sexually shamed society in the Western world. And the consequences are immensely destructive. Because gay men have been forcibly defined by sex, Again, the idea of the homosexual. They have less reluctance than most to talk about sex with me, but they still have difficulty with intimate partners with whom they most need to talk. I've seen innumerable gay couples in therapy who were having little or no sex and were both troubled by that, but they had never had anything but the most fleeting, superficial conversation about what is often the elephant in the relationship room. Working with couples, I thus often initiate a discussion of their sexual lives by asserting what ought to be obvious and would be in a less fearful, more perceptive society. Human lives are naturally erotic, and sex is one of the important and pleasurable ways we share and communicate. If you share a hike in the hills, a movie, a meal, or a bed, I sometimes ask, why not your bodies? Many gay men have never heard such an obvious affirmation of human sexuality. Many have never allowed themselves to even think such a thing. Sometimes, a couple's sexual life mutually diminishes. But more often than not, one of the two would like to have sex and repeatedly tries, but is too often rebuffed. The desirous partner finally abandons the effort and feeling of rejection, undesirability, hurt, and anger. This rejecting partner retreats still further in resentment of the expectations and often unconscious feelings of failure and guilt. The hurt, anger, and guilt are displaced into other conflicts, often about money and decision-making authority, but the sexual issue itself remains undiscussed. Other expressions of affection, simple ones, such as touching, hugging, and kissing, are avoided in all but their most perfunctory forms because they threaten to provoke the entire cycle of sexual approach, rebuff, hurt, anger, failure, and guilt. As a result, the two men often drift apart emotionally, not only because they do not have the shared bond of sex, but because they must maintain distance to keep the unspoken sexual issue unspoken. If the anger and guilt are not too destructive, a couples can often sustain a male camaraderie that assists the relationship, but not always. A majority of gay couples who come to therapy because they are fighting too much and thinking of splitting up have not had sex in a long time, but they rarely connect the issues. As with all couples, gay male relationships do not require an ongoing sexual relationship. Many relatively asexual gay relationships are happy enough without it. Two men live together, love each other, and find support and companionship in their arrangement. Sometimes, one or both seek sex outside of the relationship, one more often than not. Unfortunately, some gay men also feel shame about asexual, primary relationships. They feel they should be having sex and experience their asexuality as a confirmation that there is, indeed, something unnatural or born with gay relationships or at least theirs. They also often feel shame about outside sex, which in America is rarely an acknowledged part of conventional, socially constructed relationships.
with no prior purpose of helping gay couples initiate or reinstate sex, the question I usually ask is why do they not have sex together? More often than not, their history reveals that early in the relationship, the two men were sexual, but the sex waned, sometimes rather quickly. But why, as they got to know each other more deeply and intimately, was this natural human expression of sharing, affection, intimacy, and bonding progressively excluded? Two answers are typically offered by one or both members of the couple. They are bored with the sex they have, and one or both are no longer attracted to the other. The latter explanation is almost always revealed without the other partner present. Both of these issues, but particularly the latter, are experienced as indecipherable, autonomous, and unchangeable internal facts. In truth, both boredom and a lack of attraction can be addressed, but not simply with the revival of sports sex. Sports sex relies on two elements that no longer-term relationship can reliably provide. Novelty, which would fend off boredom, and an idealized partner who would thus be more readily experienced as attractive. Complete novelty and idealization are usually possible only with strangers. Sexual interest and the story of Lester and Bill. One of the most striking things about couples stuck in the conundrum of desired but diminished or absent sex is that they have lost the capacity for play, a capacity that all children have, but many adults have lost. The idea of boredom is obfuscating because if it alone were the reason that partners were not having sex, they would simply do something interesting, something novel and engaging, something playful. Novelty and play are intuitive, and when we cannot play, something is actively, if unconsciously, obstructing it. Some gay couples with waning sexual lives have told me that their sex consists largely watching pornography together while separately masturbating. This is a kind of sports sex stimulated by other sports sex, an often pleasurable shared activity that expresses male camaraderie. But within adult relationships, it is not quite mutual play. It is the enactment of a substitute for mutual play that is as likely to distance the two men as to support their connection and intimacy. It has its unconscious purpose the avoidance of true mutual play allows men and teenage boys who commonly engage in such activity to conceal feelings from each other that might otherwise be revealed. By its very nature, play is spontaneous and thus requires an acceptance of uncertain outcomes. Sexual play involves both an uncertain internal emotional experience and the possible revelation of that experience to another. With a stranger who knows nothing about us, and about whom we know nothing but our fantasy, such emotional self-revelation often feels safer. The interaction thus provides an opportunity to both experience and reveal feelings we normally repress or conceal. If the encounter does not feel safe enough, we can always feign responses that a stranger accepts but a long-time partner would easily perceive as false. A partner already knows us well, and we sometimes fear, will use our self-revelations or emotional vulnerabilities against us. To avoid that risk, we avoid play. If children have the advantage of intuitive natural play, adults could have another advantage. A mature self-confidence resilience enough to allow the uncertainty of play. Sexually, young men sometimes strike a balance between the two where they remain closer to early life play, even as they have developed some measure of maturity and resilience. As men age further, self-consciousness can begin to constrict resilience, as it did for 34-year-old Lester, whom I first saw for therapy in 2014. Earlier in his relationship with Bill, they had sex often, but after seven years together, Lester told me they rarely did maybe three or four times a year if we're lucky, and it's usually no good. It would be helpful if you and Bill could be more playful with each other, I said. What does that mean? 
Lester counter with discomfort in his voice and bewilderment on his face. I'm thinking of fun, emotionally expressive and spontaneous play. I have no idea how we do that. How about while he's standing at the stove scrambling eggs, you walk up behind him and lick him on the back of the neck? Lester looked stunned. <laughs> You're kidding. No. I'm serious. Why would you not do that to a man you love? Lick him on the neck? While he's making breakfast? Why not? Sex, in part, is just adult play. Or it can be. When you two are still having good sex, I imagine that licking went on. Why is this suggestion so surprising? There's a big difference between sex and licking Bill on the neck while he's cooking. Which is what? I don't know. In sex it's expected, but the thing you're describing, you wouldn't expect it and I look foolish, childish, I would feel stupid. Children know how to play, and you haven't really forgotten. Would you try playing in some way, an idea of your own, and pay attention to what feelings come up? It would be helpful. I'll think about it. What does I think about it mean? Probably not. Probably. As Lester and I continued our weekly meetings, I realized that he was, indeed, very uncomfortable with the simple, playful gesture I had suggested. He had revealed his emotional life to me, and he had a developed gay sensibility. But beginning early in childhood, he had also learned to conceal feelings, particularly gay-looking feelings by avoiding spontaneous, playful behavior. Lester had always felt uncomfortable emotionally revealing himself to Bill, and early in the relationship, Bill did not know Lester well enough to detect that restraint. It was primarily Lester who had begun retreating from sex, and when I pointed out his emotional restraint when he did have sex, he said, I have to admit that I once thought sex was about feelings. But he had little actual experience with emotional, expressive sex, and he had always been uncomfortable with what it might reveal, both of himself and of Bill. Sex with Bill had always been largely an exercise in trying to present the person Lester imagined Bill wanted him to be, mature, strong, and masculine, though Lester did not often feel like any of those things. In fact, Bill had never expressed such expectations, and I told Lester that I thought they were more of a projection of his feelings about himself than an accurate sense of what Bill expected. Lester's capacity to play with Bill seemed hogtied by a confusing and tangled interplay of misperceived expectations, containment, and posturing. With almost exclusive experience in purely erotic sports sex before their relationship, Lester and Bill had constructed a sexual life that was emotionally unexpressive and disconnected, and, not that the purely erotic component had waned with familiarity, simply boring. The sports sex they had both known had been a kind of play, but a relatively rote, constricted male play that was more about performance than emotional connection and affection. Think, yet again, of football. When I first suggested it, Lester had thought of spontaneously licking Bill on the back of the neck as a violation of that male protocol. It would express a perfectly normal need to give and receive affection that he was reluctant to acknowledge in himself, to reveal to Bill, and probably to discover in Bill. As Lester put it, Bill's and my idea of play is monopoly. Like their sexual life, monopoly had rules and the rules allowed them to reveal much less of themselves. My persistent suggestion was that they do something more interesting, and to do that, they would have to allow play and its uncertainty. They would have to be willing to let go of the idea of conscious performance, express themselves spontaneously, and then work through what they had discovered in themselves and revealed to each other. Without this change, their sexual relationship would remain boring, and possibly allow their entire relationship to slowly drift apart.